Die zwaaien hier wel de plak natuurlijk met 20 overwinningen in totaal. Hier zijn de ploegen met een zeer gestoffeerd deelnemersveld. Het heeft wat van een Ronde van Vlaanderen deelnemersveld. Trekker enkel à la Philippe. Van Aert vanaf. En dan uh, heb je ze ongeveer allemaal. En dan weet u wel dat het uh, flink gestoffeerd is, het deelnemersveld van deze driedaagse bruggen. De pannen, iedereen zijn temperatuur laten meten. Dat is uh, gewone kost. Papiertje afgeven van de coronatest, met andere woorden. Ben ik in orde? Mag ik meedoen? Dit is Niels Pollitt. Kunnen we wel zeggen dat die man hier uit koers verdwenen is. Het enige beeld van Pollitt dat... Of misschien nog het afdraaien straks. Kwiatkowski, goed ingepakt voor de mannen van Ineos Grenadiers. Met de Ronde van Vlaanderen ploeg, zeg maar. Met Luke Rowe daar ook bij. Dit is Jasper Stuiven. Jasper Stuiven met Edward. Voor, voorspeld. Windstoten tot 90 km per uur aan zee. En dat is waar we zitten natuurlijk. Oliver Naassen, hoeveel zin heeft hij er nog in? Ik denk dat ze allemaal nog wel zin hebben. Uh, want het is de sluitingsprijs, zeg maar. De allerlaatste kans om nog een uh, prijs te pakken dit seizoen. Ook voor Jens Keukenleijren. Keukenleijren met Van Marke in de ploeg. Van Marke wel een finale gereden zondag. Samen met Betjol. Betty Ol, daar moet u geen rekening mee houden. Die is er niet. Dat is ook nog een afwezige. Cavendish, die maar aan zijn afscheidstournee bezig blijft. Hoeveel keer is het nu al zijn laatste koers geweest voor Mark Cavendish? Al een keer of vier, vijf na Gent-Wevelgem. Maar wat ons betreft mag het uiteraard. De mannen van Bora met de drukke her als vooruitgestuurd. En dan naar de ploeg met de vrijbuiters. De ploeg die niet echt een sprinter aan de start hebben gebracht. Misschien wel de meest vooruitziende ploeg, want was dat wel nodig, een sprinter vandaag met zoveel wind? Asgreen, Lampaard, Seneschal, De Klerk, Mauri van Sevenant, Dries Devenijs en Bert van Lerbergen. Dat zijn de mannen bij de Koning Wikstep. Wel jongens die een sprint kunnen rijden natuurlijk. John Degenkolp is er toch wat doorgekomen de voorbije weken. Dat is Caleb Ewen en die was goed in de Scheldeprijs. Die maakte het daaraf. Als het tot een sprint komt, ik zeg wel als, dan is hij de uitgesproken man bij Lotto Soudal. Maar wat is de kans natuurlijk als je zo'n waaierfestijn voor de wielen geschoven krijgt? Christophe die kan met alles om. Alexander Christophe, ex-winnaar hier uiteraard. We zijn er wat vroeger bij met deze uitzending omdat men geweldig hard aan het koersen is en omdat uh, er uh, ook sprake is van inkorting van de wedstrijd. Daar kunnen we het uh, zo meteen nog wel over hebben. Van der Poel, de winnaar van de Ronde van Vlaanderen, is hier. Nogmaals, wat een deelnemersveld. Om duimen en vingers bij af te leken. 159 renners in totaal. Er zijn veel goede sprinters, er zijn sterke mannen. Het kan alle kanten uit, maar in de eerste plaats zal er vooral met de wind omgegaan moeten worden. En men heeft de beuk er meteen in gegooid. Na amper een kilometer of tien lag het al in stukken en brokken. Met de valpartijen helaas daar ook bij een val onder meer van Nasen en van Van Marke en Kwiatkowski. En zo kwamen er drie, vier groepen tot stand. Men heeft er echt niet te lang op gewacht. Men is meteen aan de slag gegaan met de weersomstandigheden. Het eerste uur bijna 52.
Ich Wir haben auch Sechs, hast du sie? Dit is uh, de eerste passage, dit is de kopgroep die zich gevormd heeft. En u merkt meteen dat daar Mathieu van der Poel bij zit. Die zijn benen zijn dus meer dan goed. Dit is groep 2 met Christophe daarbij. Zo meteen de samenstelling van de kopgroep uiteraard. Maar dit zijn mannen die rondfietsen op pakweg drie kwart minuut, één minuut nog steeds. Dat is werken. En werken om erbij te geraken, maar voorlopig daar niet in slagen. Colbrelli die rijdt rechtdoor, ik doe niet meer mee. Ook Polly doet niet meer mee, hebben we gezegd. Het is voorbij het seizoen, voor mij hoeft het niet meer. Hier is Rowe. Nee, dank u wel. Dat waaien rijden zo laat op het jaar, daar bedank ik vriendelijk voor. Kwiatkowski, waar is de deur, jongens? Waar is de uitgang hier? Is het langs rechts of langs links? Die gaat dan Juwen als een chauffeur op zijn stuur meenemen. Ja, dit zijn NDA's toestanden natuurlijk. 
Mannen die er geen zin meer in hebben in een zon. Well, just while we watch uh, our leading group here and the chase group gradually eating into that gap as they come along and they're coming along the long straight in uh, De Morin, which is the western side of our finishing circuit. We're kind of, if you like, halfway through our three finishing laps. Well, while we do, I should point out that Magnus is, um, in terms of this race, part of the old school, I guess, <laughs> because two years ago, uh, this race, despite no longer being the uh, Dre Dags at De Panda, the three days of De Panda, it is now a one-day race, although we did have the women's race yesterday, and we'll come...
Get him, get him, leave it. how strong the crosswind is and when it's like this basically the group ends up being the size of the width of the road yeah. and um, yeah it's uh, we've got a very select front group here of 21 riders at the moment with the likes of Matthew van der Poel, Degen Kolb uh, and uh, um, the majority of the, uh, the Koenig Quick Step team. Yeah, absolutely. It's a 21 man group. The two teams who've done best out of this one, interestingly enough, are the Koenig Quick Step, the Belgian team, but also uh, the team of Matthew van der Poel, Alperson Fenix, that team who top the pro level rankings for this year. And uh, well, they might. They've had a brilliant year. And it's not just because of Matthew van der Poel either. They've got some real firepower in there. The four riders from Alperson Fenix to make that front group, Matthew van der Poel, Tim Merlier of Belgium, Alexander Krieger, the super strong German sprinter, Jonas Rickard, also of uh, Belgium. And those four make up a really strong Alpes in Fenix, who've really swung it in their favour, particularly considering there isn't a single Jumbo Visma rider in there. We're looking at the front of our chase group now. Jasper Stuyven of Trek Segafredo, Edward Bosenhagen, trying to bring it back. And it is actually coming back. It's been coming back slowly over the last uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, Magnus, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. It started out, um, you know, the gap went up to about 55 seconds, and it's been hovering around there for, for some time. And now we can see that this group is uh, shrunk down to be small enough that every rider has to take a turn to stay in the group and that usually starts to ramp up the pace and as you can see the riders can now see the front group just up the up the road here so that will spur them on a bit as well because the tra like you said the Trek Sega Fredo's missed out on the front group here and Jumbo Visma has also missed out on this group so for them um, they, they kind of need to get back into to sort of save the day as uh, we can see that uh, they're having to deal with that valley of death as we call it as well that big concrete uh, gap in the middle of the road, uh, yeah. which makes it so technically difficult to race in this part of the world. Yeah, I, uh, I was having a conversation on air with Adam Blythe about that valley of death not long ago. Perhaps for the riders who aren't used to the roads in Belgium, it is quite unusual, isn't it? These concrete roads with, with li literally a, a tyres with gr a gully down the middle. Have you ever come a cropper on that one, Magnus? I've uh, been very, very close on a number of occasions and um, lost a few spokes from uh, missing that a rider was coming across that gap and sort of uh, not giving enough space on the side that he was swinging into. So, mm. um, yeah, you know, it, it's something that you always see that there's like a, a bit of a bigger gap in between the riders just to, uh, across the middle of that road, just to, to allow the space for the riders to flick across it. And then uh, you, you have to come across that gap very, very quickly not to get caught up in it. And if you do put a wheel into it. it you... Similar to what we now have, Magnus, wasn't it? And then this time trial where you seemed to excel when you rode it. Yeah, I said, the second stage was always start in Zottegem and uh, went out through the climb, so it was relatively hilly early on. Um, we often took on the um, the, the, the um, Kemmelberg and uh, sort of part of Gen Wevelgem course and then finished out here and then there was uh, a short road stage in the morning of about 100 kilometers and then a time trial in the pan itself that to uh, to finish off the uh, the race with so yeah i was uh, i was part of it when it was three days and four stages and uh, yeah now it's come come down to a one day race which i don't think will make any difference in terms of uh, deterring from the, uh, uh, the the importance of the race uh, it just means that it's raced in a slightly different way and uh, more often than not when you get in one day races out here in this part of the world with the crosswinds and so on the pace is so incredibly high that um it, it it's it's absolutely brutal it's uh, some most of the time harder than any mountain stage that I've ever ridden and um, you have to be on it mentally as much as you are physically to not miss a split at any point and especially when there's regroupings um, like we are likely to see here as, as, as the second group is now only 17 seconds down when that happens all of a sudden we got too many riders again and the next couple and the next crosswind section you get to you got to be on the front end of that that group again um, not to miss them when the split happens. Mm, absolutely. One rider here, by the way, who uh, 
who's going to kind of do well out of this if the second group does rejoin the first is Tom Scully, the uh, EF pro cycling rider because he actually punctured from that leading group just as they finished their first lap didn't get back in has been absorbed by this group and hopefully it looks like they're going to bring them back up to it yeah i mean that's unfortunately part of uh, part of the racing on these roads um you know there's as you can see a lot of debris on the road and um i think when we saw toro flanders as well there was a lot of punctures and uh, uh so on go uh, you know during that that race um it's it's always the case in belgium and it's it's part of the sport unfortunately but um it, it's unfortunate when you're sitting in the front group and you puncture your way out of it um clearly having had the legs and uh, the sharpness to still to still be in the front but just looking at John Daigle come on the on the front there he's pulling all sorts of faces this is a hard hard day of of, of bike racing yeah it does strike me that John Dagen Cobb is really back to very close to his very very best in this season uh, in a way like a number of the riders a bit of a lockdown has given him an opportunity to keep rebuilding and he is he has still been rebuilding again over the last few years still only 31 years of age Dagen Kolb I yeah. uh, commentated on him in the tour of Luxembourg just a couple of weeks ago uh, where he won a bunch sprint finish there and looked right back to his head bobbing head down sprinting best so um, he yeah, is, uh, he's obviously in good form. It's, it's interesting that, that Jesse, how the, this season has sort of evolved. Um, you know, we see a lot of riders um, who've started the season maybe coming back from an injury or had a bit, bit of uh, difficulty over the last couple of seasons, but they've had their head on and they made the most out of the, the, the sort of uh, time with no races and, and really trained very, very well and got themselves back to um, their former selves again whereas other riders have found it more difficult to uh, to keep going during the uh, the times with no racing and, and really struggled and uh, some of those riders we, we've seen just about starting to find their legs now after a, a couple of months of racing again so everyone is different but John Degenkolb is definitely one of those guys that seem to have flourished by uh, having a, a bit of an extended winter winter training well these guys have got a wind blowing in as we say in excess of 45 kilometers per hour from the southwest so it's quite a warm wind you'll notice there's not that many leg warmers on despite the fact they've had some early rain it is blowing up a quite mild but very stout breeze which has done all the damage today and to say the last two years we really have been treated to two big sprint finishes i think the organizers since making the switch to the one day format and choosing this very flat fast course have been waiting for the year that they thought would probably come every year where the wind, <laughs> wind absolutely shreds it that is what has happened today and we've got some real if you like if i can call them windy specialists in that front group haven't we the likes of casper asgreen um tim de klerk yves lampert the kind of riders who are very very used to racing in these conditions of course the belgians favoring these kind of conditions not least because we're in Belgium, <laughs> but it is—it's uh, got a feel of um, well, a very early spring classic. This one hasn't it? But thankfully, Magnus, it's not quite as cold as it could have been at this stage in October. Uh, no, it's not. It's—it's uh, it's about 18 degrees out here today, so it's actually relatively uh, nice conditions to to race in. Um, all the you know, when you're looking at the pictures, you you definitely draw in uh, comparisons with the uh, with the spring classics in terms of how dirty the riders and the bikes are, and um, uh, you know, it. it does does look cold but it's actually relatively nice out there um, but the wind is making it e extremely hard and uh, well you know uh, for, for me this is this, this is uh, the best bike racing that I can come up against and uh, I love watching it I loved racing it and I, I don't know why it just throws so many different uh, tactical options into the game and and also yeah, I, I love the fact when when you're racing these type of races you can see who's mentally sharp and who's really um, accustomed to racing, sitting at the front, always being in the right position and having that feel for when the wind is about to happen. And we could see yesterday in the women's race, especially, you know, when you can see a, a team of riders coming up towards the front and, and you having to be a sort of spot when those, uh, when you can see a, a number of riders from one or two different teams, you know that something is, a, uh, is about to happen and, and uh, you're likely to turn left or right at some point and get another crosswind section. And that, that just makes it for, for very aggressive, intense and, and interesting racing as far as I'm concerned. 
I'm sure you'll agree with me, Magnus, that it was um, a great race yesterday, always good, and I know we'll both be singing from this hymn sheet as we both have uh, our kind of fingers and feet in women's cycling through familial circles, that the, the women's race is run over much the same finishing circuit as this, in fact the same finishing circuit as this, but also that it runs the day before and uh, is given the same kind of prominence as well. A great race yesterday, but just it just makes so much sense to me to be pairing the top women's races with the men's ones. Yeah, definitely. I, I totally agree with that and and um, you know it's uh, the fact that it's the same course to start, start in the same place and and uh, just run a couple of laps less but yesterday was a it was a long hard race for the women as well 160 kilometers almost uh, that, that they covered and um, it, it proved to be every bit as um, intense and interesting as uh, what we're watching on the screen here now mm. if you've not seen the finish from yesterday folks by the way do look it up on the uh, GCN app or the Eurosport app on the player um, because it was a fairly controversial finish, wasn't it? Julian de Hora, the, uh, the Belgian sprinter, taking the win, well, it seemed like she'd taken the win on the line just ahead of Lorena Wiebes, but only for that to be scrubbed. What was your thoughts on that, Magnus, from yesterday? Well, you know, you could see that Julian was definitely moving across uh, across the road, um, but I didn't I didn't personally deem it to be a, a dangerous move. She um, it looked more like it's 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 interesting when, when you're sprinting. Sometimes you you, you hit the, you hit out so hard um, and and put all the power down, and sometimes you you tend to your bike tend to sort of drift into one direction, and if you change that direction, you're losing the drive of the, of the bike, so you're having to sort of follow the, the, the direction of the bike and that looked to me one it uh, these days and ultimately they deemed that it was a foul move um, from the times of racing when I was sprinting uh, that was very much an, an okay move there was plenty of space for Lorena to come come through on the inside between uh, Jolene and, and the barriers um, but yeah um, you know it's it's one of those where the old school view and the new school view uh, are slightly different I think <laughs> Well, that gap, <laughs> we thought it was coming right down, is now starting to go out again. It's probably part of the reason... <laughs> They go through uh, Ustinkirke and uh, head towards the coast itself, the coast proper, as they skirt along the sand dunes of Coxeda. Um, every now and again, the riders get a little bit of cover as they pass through towns and villages but it is pretty much a straight line all the way towards the coastline and we're getting a look here of just how uh, De Koenig Quickstep are looking to control this one and maintain that gap a little bit more pressure being applied there by Kasper Asgreen that may well be why the gap started to go out again yeah, well, as soon as, uh, because it's on the circuit and we're getting these uh, directional changes all the time, uh, obviously it's, uh, it's a lot easier to, uh, to, to ride when you get in the tailwind and a lot more of the riders will uh, be, feel that they're, they're happy to contribute in the tailwind than they might be. Yes. <laughs> 
all the stages when it was a three-day race up, up until what two years ago but uh, he's Mr. Consistent on all fronts isn't he? Yeah he um, I mean if you were a sprinter who could deal with the um, with a sort of classics uh, type of climbs the Tour of Flanders type of climbs then this is your dream race really uh, you know every stage has been um, of this kind of character throughout the history of the race and uh, you know, Christoph at, uh, at his very, very best was always, well, he was one of the fastest sprinters in the world for a number of years, and he also managed to deal with the climbs in a very good way. So pretty much every every three days of the Panna stage is something that will have suited him, whether it was 100 kilometers short stage in the morning uh, before the time trial, or whether it was the, the big classic stay, as they said, with a finish in, in Zotterham. Um, so so I'm, I'm not the slightest bit surprised that he's he's won as many stages as he has done. No, and it's not just the stages. The stage winners he's, uh, he's had have given him high overall positions across the three days. The Dredagza as well, because he was um, second in, he was third, sorry, in the last running of this race as a three-day back in 2017 behind the winner, Philippe Gilbert. Second behind Louis Vestre, the Dutch rider, 2016. And, of course, he was the winner in 2015 ahead of Stein de Volder and a young man by the name of Bradley Wiggins. So the face is of pain from the Trek Segafredo riders looking to try and continue closing this down but it is only going out still at the moment Magnus 44 seconds I wouldn't be surprised if we're back to a minute again at some point I don't know whether Jumbo Visma have given up on this one or uh, I mean it's strange they've got Mike Turnison as you would think their protected sprinter or team leader for the day but they're not contributing a great deal now I know they have been uh, maybe um, they're just toasted you're always in a difficult position um, if, if you're uh, if you only got one or two riders in the group and uh, you, you're trying to make your way back on again, it, it's you, ha you have to conserve energy for when if you're making that that junction, um, but at the same time investing energy to get there. And it, it is a really really difficult position to uh, to be in how you uh, how you manage all of that. So yeah, I, I'm not surprised to see it starting to go up again. They made a big effort to try and get get back onto the front group, but I think the front group also realised that okay there's a big group coming here now um we might as well, well invest the energy and uh, and try and bring this uh, get get this away from um, from those guys again. And you know, with the with the riders that we got in this group, and I'm I'm thinking the likes of Matteo Trentin, and we got uh, John Dagen Kolb, uh, obviously uh, Matthew Van der Poel, um, and and most of the um, the Kearney Quickstep riders who are sort of statesmen of the of of the peloton. They will have all had a chat with each other and. Uh, try to motivate the group and say right guys um, unless we all invest in a, a bit of energy into this here now the, that group is going to come back and it's say, you know back to status quo again we're going to have to re redo all of this work again to uh, to try and split it up again and chances are we won't make it or uh, a couple of us won't make it into to the next split and with that you know you can see straight away that the uh, the, the, the the riders have invested the uh, uh, the energy into uh, to keeping this going 
This is Florian Senechal on the front, the Frenchman who would have been very much looking forward to Paris-Roubaix. Um, it's an odd one in a way, isn't it, Magnus, that this would have been the warm-up race for Paris-Roubaix in much the same way that it has been in its normal spring, guys, the warm-up for the Tour of Flanders. Instead, it would have seen itself sitting between Flanders and Paris-Roubaix, and we now can't help but think that actually this being the last one-day World Tour race of the year is even more important. Yeah, it, it definitely is even more important. I mean, I think uh, we, we've had that sort of sensation for um, since, since the restart of the season that every bike race that these guys have gotten to has it's been raced as if it was the last race of the season. If it, if it was the last race that they were doing, every team, every rider has committed a hundred percent into it, and. Um, well, I for one think it's, it's made for some really interesting, uh, slightly different tactics, slightly different approach to the races, and we've had some, some fantastic battles uh, throughout the whole of the season, and uh, it's no different today here out on the roads uh, around the Pana. No, absolutely. We're getting closer to uh, completing the second of three laps now. And uh, we're looking down on that chasing group. Definitely the input has gone and we're getting closer and closer to the minute. Nice, consistent uh, contribution of work by the looks of it from the vast majority of these 22 riders in the lead group. And that now starting to tell on a bit of um, dis discord in the group behind, certainly not contributing in the way they were. And let's just rattle through the riders in this front group. As we say, there are five riders from Decoding Quickstep. Kasper Askreen, the Danish uh, national champion. Eve Lampa, Florian Senechal, Tim de Klerk, and Bert van Leberger. Just the one rider for... Uh Bora Hansgrohe, that is JMP Drucker, otherwise known as JP Drucker, the Luxemburger. You can see Piotr Havik on the front there. He's the rider in the colours of uh, Rival Securitas cycling team. There he is in that uh, stripy orange top. Uh, we have two Lotto Sudar riders. We did have three because Freddy Frissom was in here at one stage, uh, but actually crashed out, I believe. We haven't seen his crash, but uh, that's what we're reported as having happened. But it does leave Jong Dagenko with a very strong sprint uh, lead out man, or certainly a keen ally in Jasper de Boist. Uh, super strong sprinter himself, capable of winning from a group like this in actual fact. Alongside him, Max Walscheid, the German rider, is the only representative of Team NTT. Uh, there's another Norwegian in here in the shape of Sven-Erik Bystrom of uh, UAE Team Emirates. You'll have noticed Stefan Kung already, the big tall figure of Kung, bronze medalist of course from the World Road Race Champs in Yorkshire last year. Uh, he is in here in the colours of Group Armour FDJ. There is one Ineos Grenadier in here and that is Chris Lawless, the British rider. And as I say, then we have that uh, super strong quartet of Alperson Fenix riders, Mathieu van der Poel, their leader, Tim Merlier, the sprinter, Alexander Krieger, also sprinter, German rider. I've noticed him doing a lot at the front already. And Jonas Rickart, uh, a real Swiss army knife of a, uh, of a rider, the German, very capable in lumpy terrain, but contributing, I suspect, today to working for Mathieu van der Poel. Do you think that'll be their... Um, their tact from now on, Magnus, looking to set up Van der Poel, or is it more about Tim Malier? I mean, they've got a number of options now, that team. Well, I, I actually think that um, they will look after Tim Malier uh, for, for this one. Uh, uh, you know, the, Van der Poel has, has seemed very, very happy to, throughout the season, do the lead-outs for, for, for Merlid and uh, successfully doing so in, in a couple of occasions on some pretty big bike races. So, um, but I guess the fact that Van der Poel is as fast as he is, this is a somewhat reduced group with, okay, there's some fast riders in here, um, but I think out and out right bunch kick, I, I think Tim Merlid has still got the, the edge on uh, Matthew van der Poel and I think van der Poel is better at doing a lead out than what Tim Merlier would be so um, I guess the equation has to be done within uh, within the team on the road here now um, as they're getting towards the finish who's feeling better who's uh, who's not up for it and who is and uh, with that uh, they, they will will they will try and, and set something up but you know with uh, Krieger and uh, and Rickard in there as well Jonas Rickard is slowly becoming one of the better lead out riders out there at the moment he's he's 
able to position uh, his team incredibly well. He's got a good turn of speed and for a very distance as well. So he can go short and really hard or he can actually do a relatively long turn on the front uh, in the wind with his riders to uh, make up for any shortcomings anywhere. But today is a completely different type of bike race. Um, it's all going to come down to really who's got the legs towards the end of the, of the day as uh, as we see the wind is is as brutal as it is they're even struggling to to keep the bike across to the right hand side of uh, of the road here yeah, you'll be able to explain this better than me, Magnus, but the riders here trying to form something of an echelon, but actually struggling to get the bike to the right-hand side of the road. They actually are, aren't they? Pushing themselves as far right as they can. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, if you want everyone in the group to get shelter, then you, you pan across and you sit over in the right-hand gutter um, and riding there and, and you're taking the turns and moving across out again. Um, if you want to be a little bit cheeky, then you tend to stay more towards towards the center line of the road. And that usually means that a few of the riders further down, down the back won't get as much shelter as they uh, would like. And uh, a lot of the time that, uh, it's just a way of, if you know that there's a couple of strong riders that are about to get in onto the wheel, then you drift across the road a little bit and do exactly what they're doing here now, just squeezing that space. Um, then then you, can, uh, you can make those riders work that little bit harder. And, but at the same time, um, until it's really time to do something uh, and try and split the, the, the race up, uh, I don't think you want to be doing too many things like that. But with a crosswind at 50k an hour and uh, the, the, the deep section wheels that a lot of these riders are, are, are riding at the moment, you know, it, it will be difficult to, uh, to, to hold the bike there and to get it, uh, get it across the road as Tom Sconch is uh, now deciding that he's had enough. Yeah, well, Trek Segafredo actually can uh, slap themselves on the back for actually contributing to this chase. As I say, Jumbo Visma really seem to have switched off in, I think, I don't, I don't know, could it be that they're trying to encourage the other teams to come forward and do more, Magnus, or is it really just they've done enough? Pascal Encorn, I think it is there, who is, uh, yeah. yes, it is, now also off the back. Well, I think it's, um, you know, they may have invested an awful lot of energy right at the start when they saw that they, uh, they missed the split. And... Uh, rode hard for a long period of time and then realized that hang on we're, we're we're actually running out of legs here and um sooner or later you you just haven't got any more to uh to work with and and the, you know the uh, the group up ahead is drifting away from you and and all of a sudden you realize well we're going to have to go back into the group somehow try and get a bit of shelter try and recover somewhat and hopefully a few of the other riders will start taking bigger longer turns then um to to keep this going but um yeah it's uh it's it's strange not to see a uh, a number of uh, riders in the black and yellow uh, kit up in the front group because the guys that we got on the start from the start line from Jumbo Visma are all riders who should be very capable of uh, of dealing with these uh, conditions. Hmm. Well, let's get a look at these faces. Casper Astrin looks cool. Um, Stefan Kung there, the Group Armour FTJ rider, giving some shouts to the others. He's actually, sounds to me like he's trying to give some orders to the Koenig. Oh, we've got a man down. That is Havoc. Piotr Havoc straight down out the back of that group. Gosh, I don't know what's happened there. A little touch of wheels or something. It looks like yeah. he's taken Max, Max Weibscheid out as well there. Oh, he's gone down very hard. Yeah, just a typical little flick of, uh, flick of the bikes in the crosswind. And, uh, you know, the, the problem with this is that you have to overlap wheels to get the shelter but as soon as you overlap the wheels then obviously if there's that that sideways uh, switch um, then all of a sudden you you, you find yourself in a, in a spot of bother and this here now is definitely to try and split this up we can see the two Alpecin Phoenix riders there now very much on the limit here with uh, uh, Tim Merlier in the second place there um, being towed up but uh, yeah they've decided that it's time to make another split here and uh, and Magnus, is, are they doing this? Do you think because I mean I know I know it's often not talked about, but are they are they driving harder because they've heard the crash, or is it more that, uh, or is it more that they were going to do that anyway at this point in the course with the wind? I think I think the move was already made before the crash, and um, the, the crash happened as a, as a consequence to it. And uh, it's a shame for Piotr Harvik here. It is. 
clearly made that front group been very strong in there and um, has now gone um, yeah. gone down very hard. But you can see all of the riders right on the limit here now, trying to hold the wheel and struggling to do so. And this is just the the less riders you want with you, the the further in towards the the right hand gutter you will move uh, move the whole uh, the whole wing. But now you can see they're starting to open up a bit. Okay, we got rid of some weight here, but um, yeah, it's this is why I, I do absolutely love this kind of <laughs> you're stuff. You're enjoying this, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> you're a masochist. That's what we love, because without these kind of windy conditions, we would be bowling along, perhaps a little breakaway that's gone, that's being closed down all the time, the sprint trains come to the front, and then we're treated to a really exciting sprint finish. This is totally different, of course. We've fed them into the West Flandrian shredder, and they've come out the other end, as you see them, and we're not done yet either. Two of the riders off the back there, Sven-Erik Bystrom, uh, the Norwegian in the colours of UAE Team Emirates. Now he's the only UAE rider in this leading group. He's out the back of it now. He's got one of the Quick Quickstep riders with him for company. I'm not sure it wasn't Eve Lampart, and if it is, that's a big miss in that group because he's in cracking form, having just finished in uh, fifth in the Tour of Flanders on Sunday, of course. But they did have good numbers in that leading group, to Quick Quickstep, so you might get a bit of a regrouping. It's highly unlikely. Well, we know that Havoc definitely won't be getting back on. And there is the shot back to our chasing group. Now, I wonder if it's disrupted anything. One minute and seven seconds the time we're being given back to this group now. Yeah, I don't think it will change much at all uh, from uh, from the front riders' point of view, from the front group. Um, you know, they, they've made that split and they've tried to get rid of a few riders. Interesting to see that there's a couple of the Kerning Quickstep riders missing missing the back end of that um, and, get, and getting dropped. Um, but... You know, this is this is what you do. This is how you race uh, crosswind uh, bike race. Oh, oh, not again! Oh, we do not. I tell you what, I don't know whether it's the wind or what out there, Magnus, but yeah. we are... <laughs> they're feeding themselves into the shredder at this rate. Another touch of wheels. Uh, that looked to me uh, like Alexander Krieger, actually. I'm not it's sure he didn't it, touch the wheel of one of his teammates. That, yeah, that was uh, Tim, Tim Lear ended up uh, on the receiving end of that one. And it uh, be interesting to see if he can get back in here again now. But you can see it's just quite literally the, the, uh, the gusts of wind uh, taking the riders from one side to, uh, of the road and, and moving them out. And Tim Lear there just, just saving that one. Wow. And that is, uh, that is some save as well, Magnus, as you say, isn't it? He was actually sat on the top tube, I think, in the end, with both feet unclipped. Yep. <laughs> Great bag, bike handling by Tim Mullier. Himself a very, very good Ooh, cross rider. Another. another kick out from Kasper Asgreen. So this testing finishing circuit, if we can call it that, <laughs> is causing trouble in all sorts of ways, uh, not least with the riders causing trouble for themselves grippy moments. We mustn't forget, of course, these are the last 30k of this uh, very unusual season for these riders, and many of them actually haven't had quite the opportunity to really prove themselves this year. So nervous moments for a lot of these riders who maybe haven't yet bagged that win, haven't yet proven themselves, or as you say, Magnus, haven't yet got that contract sorted for next year. Yeah, and there's, there's plenty of riders still that haven't got there, with so many teams folding, and uh, we saw so, um, Piotr Havik they crash out of uh, the front group and potentially out of the race he's riding for another team that is that is closing down for for next season um, mm. and uh, you know I think there, there, there are more risks and more uh, you know it's, it's harder for these days now because there are so many riders without contracts and with a few teams folding and so on than than what we potentially would have seen in previous years because they're all fighting for their careers and the livelihoods at, at this moment in time so Matthew van der Poel goes to the front and starts to string things out again, possibly to string a little bit of sense into these riders, get them to ride a little bit more constructively and sensibly. The course, of course, is ever-changing, and every time it does, the wind is ever-changing. This is the German Alexander Krieger on the front. Uh, you can spot him a mile off usually because he has the shortest shorts normally and the shortest socks <laughs> straight out of the late 90s. Alexander Krieger, very, very fast in a straight line. And Van der Poel, you can see from the face, Magnus, is, uh, is not holding back. He doesn't look like he's saving himself for the finish. No, he definitely isn't. Um, but but it, it's, it's, again, crosswind racing. It's like that. You, you, you will be on your absolute limit. Um, trying to, uh, to to stay in that group and you're having to take turns all of the time because the moment you start missing turns is the moment you will uh, you, you will 
basically be uh, on on your last stretch. It, it, it's if if you're sitting down the back of the group and you're missing out on the turn, so they, all they do, uh, the front riders, is you squeeze it, squeeze across the road a fraction, and uh, with that you end up then on that sort of final string of the road, and you sat there, and it's only a question of time for how long can you hold on before the elastic snaps, and uh, uh, that's why we we often find that uh, in a group like this, everyone will take their turn, and sometimes you're wondering why. Well, why is he's on his own in this group? Why is he ta why is he taking taking turns on the front? He should be sitting on the back, saving his legs. Well, the easiest way to uh, uh, to save your legs is is by taking turns and, and following through. Well, Jempi Drucker, the Luxemburger, on the front of our leading group right now in the colours of Bora Hansgrohe, the sole Bora rider in there. Alexander Krieger again doing long, long turns on the front in the company of Matthew van der Poel, the Dutch national road race champion. Um, what a group of hitters for this kind of race in here. If we look through the names, we haven't even mentioned Christophe Laporte, the Frenchman, the sole Cofidis rider in here, very capable of sprinting his way onto the podium in this kind of company, that's for sure. Stefan Kung, the big diesel engine, as we say, the super strong time trialist in the colours of Group Armour FDJ. John Degenkolb, who's got an absolutely ridiculous palmares of races. He's won from Paris-Roubaix, Milan-San Remo, a multiple Grand Tour stage winner as well, of course. And there's other riders in here. We also have mentioned um, in a similar kind of mold to uh, I guess Tim Malia, Hugo Hofstetter of uh, Israel Startup Nation, very capable of also getting himself onto the podium in this race and we're looking back here at Bystrom and uh, Florian Seneschal still battling to try and get back into this group. Yeah, they're only they're only, they're only uh, uh, about five or ten seconds off the back of that group, and uh, it looks like uh, the pace has gone out of the front group somewhat. As uh, one of the other Dickerney Quickstep riders is uh, just trying to, uh, I think he put his hand up there for some service of some sort. <laughs> he might be calling for the service car to give a little bit of draft to Van Leerberg. If that's <laughs> who's coming up. It wasn't Florian Sanichal at all. It is by Strum and uh, Bert van Leerberger, and they're going to get back on by the looks of it as well. I think possibly a little bit of radio talk going on there, De Koenig Quickstep riders letting them get back in. And that's what they've done. So we're back to, I think, about 15 riders in the front there. And we've still got all of the uh, Alpha Synthetics riders, but we are now just down to four to Koenig Quickstep. Pressure on those two teams, isn't it, Magnus, to make this one count? If you're in one of those two teams and, uh, and one of your men doesn't win or at least get on the podium, something's gone wrong. Yeah, it definitely has. It, it, is, uh, it is really up to, uh, to the Koenig Quickstep and uh, Alpha Synthetics to, uh, to pull this one off with, uh, with the number of riders that they have in here. But... Um, as as we said, it's it's not a a, a typical bike race in that um, you know it's they're sitting here and and sort of it's easy to roll along and stay in the group and we can start thinking about tactics etc etc. It's 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 just about survival and whoever's got something left in their legs uh, coming in towards the final. Um, it'll be interesting to see how much. Uh, Matthew van der Poel has got left in the legs after after the ride that he did on on Sunday. Um, you know, has he managed to recover? Is he uh, is he finding this uh, tough going today? Well, he does always look so good, doesn't he? Um, I did see on his Twitter feed, he said something along the lines of uh, he and his teammates having really enjoyed themselves after his uh, Flanders win on Sunday for a couple of days. I think he mentioned something along the lines of having a couple of days of celebrating and enjoying it, uh, a little spin, and then he's ready for this one. So, well, let's see. He's made it into that front group. Um, tactically, he's always so on it, so switched on. And uh, he just, you know, he does always look good, doesn't he, Magnus? I don't know well, you think, but he's got his yeah. wonderful style on the bike. So a lot like his, a lot like his dad, actually. You know, very, um, very smooth, long-limbed, smooth, and you know, unmistakable style. Well, I think it's if taking someone like uh, like Mathieu, he when he pins a number on, he's there to uh, to perform and to to do a, a, a job. And um, he's, he, I, you very rarely see him sitting and and not really being part of of the race he he will give everything that he has on every day that he pins a number on and and
in in these type of races, it's it's all about really how much you position, how well you position yourself going into the first section of crosswind, where you know it's going to happen, and it's just a question of can you get yourself into the right place and be there, and have you got some form of legs for for a bit to uh, uh, to sort of make that split, and then once you're in there and you start taking the turns, it's not actually that um, that hard for the for the opening part of it to uh, to keep yourself in the uh, in the front group it's it's more a question of the wearing down process of uh, of riding here the, the the you know whether that actually um, whether you got the legs and um, and whether you've recovered from the race that you did previously and uh, and so on so I'm not at all surprised to see Mathieu in <laughs> Say hello, Papa. in a group of this size, haven't you, Magnus? But he doesn't seem to be holding back that much for someone who's probably one of the fastest sprinters in that group. Well, you, you can't really hold back. That, that's the whole thing. It, uh, when you get into the front, the harder the turn you do, uh, the quicker you'll get around the rider in front of you and the quicker you end up getting shelter. So uh, it looks like they're putting an awful lot of effort into, uh, into the turns they're doing, but they're relatively short turns. Even if they're frequent, they're short. Uh, and for someone like John Degenkorb, who's you know, a top-class sprinter, um, he, he, for him it's much easier... <laughs> Um, it, it, yeah, it, it, it's deceiving how they how they ride and the way it looks uh, compared to how it actually feels when when you're on the bike in there. There we get a look at the sand dunes. It's part. Of And uh, Dunan, the Dunan Cross is the name of that famous cyclocross race or series of cyclocross races I was telling you guys about in Coxeda. So Matthew van der Poel will feel very much at home here, I think, even if he is missing cross season, as you were mentioning, Magnus, because the cyclocross season actually is kind of overlapped and started already, although it's missing some big names who are still racing on the road circuit. And this is the scene of it. If you've not seen it, look it up perhaps uh, on, <laughs> online because it's really iconic cross racing in the deep, deep sand dunes and cyclocross riders from all across the world will come to this part of West Flanders literally just to experience and practice riding in that deep, deep sand dune, those conditions.
Yeah, they uh, definitely. It's uh, it's a special place. It's uh, it's in Belgium terms. It's uh, it's a uh, it's uh, a holy place that that you know if you um, if you enjoy your cyclocross, um, this is like where 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 you have to to venture to at least uh, once in your life to uh, to experience and watch uh, the the cross race here. Unfortunately, this year it won't take place. Um, which is a, a shame that they've had to cancel the race here on the, on the dunes in Coxida, but um, you know it, it is what it is, and uh, we're grateful that we're getting some some cyclocross still on on the on the screens and uh, continuing to see you know two grand tours t um, going on at the at the moment and uh, the three days of uh, the. here that we got today yeah what a day did you ever think we'd be talking on the mic magnus on the same day as we're talking commentating on uh, the day dags the Depana and the vuelta's on oh and the giro's on it's uh, it's been a crazy year for all sorts of um, bad reasons but at the same time it doesn't half make the season look interesting we might we might looking back we might miss this crazy unexpected unusual season if everything's to go straight back to as it was next year yeah, <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> it, it, it's strange thinking that we've, we've just seen Tour of Flanders and we're likely to, well, hopefully, fingers crossed, we got Tour of Flanders in six months again and in uh, the beginning, beginning of April. Um, but yeah, I, I do hope that we're getting this um, the next season to be somewhat more normal. Um, but judging by how well the season has gone so far, COVID rest restrictions taken into account, uh, we've managed to race since the beginning of August. And uh, yes, there has been a few uh, positive cases, but that was always likely to happen. But it's been contained, it's been managed well. And. Uh <laughs> Um, you know, if we can continue racing in the way that we are now, then um, you know we're, we're likely to at least be able to save the sport in in one form or another. Uh, and I, for one, I, I you know, the moment the, uh, the cycling was on on TV again, that, that was uh, a weight lifted off my shoulders because I could, I had some live sport to watch, and and um, you know that it's such a big part of of my lifestyle anyway. Um, and I'm sure many of you out there watching this today will. Uh, feel exactly the same way. We got live sports happening, although on TV I can't necessarily. Really go and watch it, um, but you know it's still it's still such a great feeling to to, to be able to watch the guys do their jobs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all of my joking aside. As we roll under the 1K to go banner, so we're about to enter the final lap, of course. But all joking aside, we have been really spoiled these last few weeks. We've had, um, you know, we've had the triple espresso version of pro cycling all in one go, and at times it's been, it's been a real, um, a real kind of. A, ma a marathon just to get it all on not least for the fans enjoying race after race after race but for the other race organizers the uci i guess the commissaires who work on this races the police outriders all the people involved with the rolling circus of world professional racing having had that quiet downtime suddenly into this really intense period that we're now coming to the end of and we do have fingers firmly crossed that the Vuelta makes its way all the way through because certainly it started with an absolute bang yesterday didn't it we yeah. are uh, yeah we're right in there yeah it definitely did so we're now getting uh, another view of the finishing straight here with the riders coming up it's still 42 seconds down to that second group 22k to go yeah, one lap or less than a less. Uh, it is one lap, and uh, the group's whittled down. Actually, there's a few people who've gone out the back of it that I hadn't noticed. Uh, one of whom was Jasper de Bust, of course, the teammate of uh, Dagenkolb, John Dagenkolb. Now, Jasper de Bust would have been an excellent uh, protector, if you like, for Dagenkolb in the finale. 
But that wind and the battling into it for these riders has just thinned down this group to a group of real favourites now. Matthew van der Poel, the Tour of Flanders winner, the Dutch national road race champion, leading out of that corner as they head out onto their final lap of our finishing circuit. They, uh, they head back inland along the Kuburgerstraat towards uh, Bulls Camp. And that's where they'll hit the wind again. They're nicely protected here as they ride back out of Japan. This is uh, the next group to cross the line. Uh, yeah, Jess, I think it'd be interesting to see now when we get out into uh, to that, that crosswind uh, stre stretch again, whether one of, uh, I'm thinking more Alpes in Phoenix, seeing as they're still in, in that front group with four riders, whether they try to split the group up again and really sacrifice a couple of their riders to, uh, to try and, and, and shrink this group down to uh, a much smaller number again, maybe split it in half again if they can, um, just to, again, you know, sort of um, emphasize the odds for, for uh, Tim Merlier, who's, I think, in that group looking by far the freshest, when uh, certainly from his facial expressions anyway. Yeah, he does look good, despite his um, top tube surfing that he's done. And this is group three on the road. Oh, sorry, it's being called group two because we have got a little group we saw across the line. So these guys are at 42 seconds down, it's saying. There's a small group, including the, the, those who were really distanced during that crash. Chris Lawless, the British rider, is in that group that's already across the line. And this is what they're calling the official group two. And Guillaume van Kielsbolk, uh, Max Wildscheid, Wildscheid, I should say, Chris Lawless and Ben de Klerk are the four riders who are in between these two groups. They have some chance of getting back on. This group here, I don't know, Magnus, I think it might be too late as we go into this final lap, unless we start messing around in that leading group. Yeah, I think you're right, um, but I, I reckon it's it's unlikely yeah. that they're going to completely stop pushing on here in in this group. Now everyone will think, okay, this is I've, I've got a good chance of of a solid result here now if we keep this ticking over, and and with that, I, I think we're going to see the speed continue into. Uh, to be um, high enough to keep that second group um, at bay. Jeffy yeah, Drucker. At this stage of the race, of course, we could well have been looking at a breakaway of chances who've been out there for some 100k or more, couldn't we, Magnus? But instead, due to the wind, as always happens in these races, the wind is, if, if you like, what brings the cream to the very top, isn't it? And we're yeah. not looking at a group of chances. We're looking at the big guns here. Uh, and in amongst them, some really powerful... Um, Team helpers who've helped get them there. That's Jonas Rickart there, uh, winner of the Dwarves Tour Hageland this year, actually taking off late on in that race to win solo in the end. So, as you say, a very capable all rounder in actual fact, yeah. Jonas Rickart. You know, I think it's. Um it's definitely um, a, a, an interesting situation here now. With we have still got, uh, was it four uh, De Kerning Quick Step riders mm. in here, and uh, so they're just having a chat here now, just saying, <laughs> "Okay, are we uh, are we going to do this in the yeah. crosswinds or not?" <laughs> I you love know. it. They've been listening to you, Magnus. If Magnus has just said that we're going to split it. Are we going to split it or you? Don't know. Looks like you. I tell you what, you do it. <laughs> no, I think I think it's uh, it, it, it does require a uh, a, a concert. A, a Effort by 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 both teams to really put mm. the the rest of the guys at bay, but mm. you can see here now there's definitely some some they're trying to uh, to cook something up here now <laughs> to, um, to to put a, a move in, and I think we'll be as you see now there's plenty like those two teams are more or less lining up in a row here now. Be, yep. I think yep. you'll find that Matthew van der Poel will somehow now drift across into this lineup as well. Mm. Um, he will find himself in a, yeah, being part of that. Interesting, Magnus. This is why we have you alongside me here, because your insight is, I think, going to prove bang on. That conversation wasn't about hey, what we're doing when we get back to the team hotel tonight. There was none of that. That is all about what we're going to do in the next, well, 10K. See, it, it continues to be hard as well. So a yep. couple of words here, a couple of words there, <clears> and um, <throat> just just making sure that we get this right. You know exactly when we're going to go and at what point, who's starting it, and, and so on. And there will be... Uh, 
and it, you can kind of sense when it needs to happen as well. So when you sat in that group, you know that you're going to do something, and you know when the right moment is. And it will be, I think you'll you'll see um, all of a sudden they'll just switch across the road, and they will be out of the saddle board line sprinting to uh, to get that going to catch out as many of the riders who are in the um, in the wrong side of the uh, of the lineup, um, catch them out as as much as you can. Gosh, you've got to feel for these four. They are doing some ride. Big, big turns being done by Guillaume van Kulsbok, uh, the Belgian rider at the front of this one for the CCC. And actually, they're doing really well to hold 40 seconds to that group. They look like they closed it under 40 seconds, not giving up. That's got last race of the season written all over it, that. <laughs> Chris Lawless was in there as well, the Ineos Grenadier. But I don't know if I saw him in there now. It looked to me like four riders, 40 seconds. The last race of the season is always uh, likely to, to, to turn out in two different ways. Either like you saw uh, with, with Luke Rowe there relatively early on, I've missed the break, I'm turning back, I'm going into the bus. Um, and I'm having a shower and I'm sitting here watching these guys on, on TV. Uh, alternatively, you find yourself kind of part of the bike race and you really empty the tank with everything that you have to, to get the maximum out of after the final day of the season. But look at that, Magnus. Check the Cofidis rider at the back there. Christophe Laporte, I think, staying a little bit out of this one. Very strong sprinter. Only Cofidis rider in there. And the Frenchman, I think, is just going to sit and wait a little bit and just let things happen in front of him. Pick off any wheels that open up. It's a dangerous place to be, of course, at the back of the group if they are going to try and split it. But, uh, he's, well, he's either swinging or he's sitting. One of those two. Well, what do you think? Uh, well, I think he's currently <laughs> sitting and he's um, sometimes, you, if you can, you tend to take a couple miss a couple of turns and especially if you're seeing that okay there's uh, see more conversations there with van der poel to, to the team car um you tend to sit look okay is there a number of riders from uh, from the same team all lined up together um and is there another team with multiple riders in who's kind of infiltrating and lining up with them uh at which point i'm gonna sit here and wait until the last rider of those guys go through and then i'm gonna latch on to that and hopefully that means that when they do go i i'm the first man on the last wheel of of the uh of the two teams to end up um uh, making the attack I should point out for viewers, by the way, that our uh, kilometre ticker has been up and down like I don't know what <laughs> over the last hour or so. Yeah, I think it was showing about 20k to go not long ago, and now it's showing 28k to go. Yeah, it was down to yeah. 22. <laughs> I was getting worried. <laughs> you can hang on, that's, that's not right. Um, these finishing circuits are... Uh, are 46 kilometers in length so that makes a little bit more sense now as we head our yeah. way a little bit further inland i keep calling the finishing circuit it's a right old loop it really is a big one as they come right the way back inland they're skirting not too far from the french border in actual fact as they go a bit further southeast and then they'll turn uh left effectively when they get all the way down to the the bottom part of our course also almost at the castel Beauvoir, which is one of the most uh, most important tourist traps around this part of the world then they hand their way all the way back in towards uh, the seaside at coxider and that's by then i think when we'll be seeing potentially a bit of a whittling down of this group if what magnus is uh, predicting is going to happen is going to happen every single one of these turns offers another opportunity to be hit by the wind from another side and it is telling in our chasing group as well by the looks of it yeah that's uh, benjamin de clerk i think uh, officially ran yeah. out of legs yeah here yeah. we go right so those two teams as you say magnus now starting to drill as they've turned into the wind alpha and fenix and then, uh, well, it is, isn't it? Those two teams combining the first five or six riders in the group. That now, is the, uh, the interesting part is going to be here now as the opposite Phoenix rider comes back. He's going to have to take pretty much take the wheel of uh, Matthew van der Poel. They're going to have to let riders in so that none of the guys back here end up getting the um, being able to uh, to infiltrate the. Uh, um, the echelon at the front, but didn't get catch out as many riders as I thought Ooh. they were going to do. No, Kung is the rider closing that gap down. And that looks like, uh, well, that was, oh, I look like Ben de Klerk there, but it can't be Ben de Klerk because he's already off the back of the chase group. But it has done a bit of damage in there. It's making Kasper Askreen actually have to chase back on. And it's his own teammates doing that damage. <laughs> Christophe Laporte has now moved to the front of this one. Yeah. 
Well, I think they, they didn't. Uh, they possibly went a little bit uh, too early with that, and uh, there weren't enough riders. So, uh, from from the two teams together, they needed to uh, to play that a little bit differently. And oh, see those flicks across the road again <clears> from <throat> the wind. Yep. 48 kph this wind coming from their right as they make their way along the Coburger Strat down to the most southerly point you can see they push right up against the barriers now this is the section of the course which we call De Muren where the uh, the organizers have always expected there to be these big splits coming with the wind you can see they've got a curving left hander at the end as they make their way around onto Moorenstienweg which is the bottom part of the course uh, Oh, in the moment, the gap's not cracking in the way we thought they might. Yes, they are. Hugo Hofstetter. Hugo Hofstetter has felt the hammer off the back wheel there of Matthew van der Poel. And van der Poel is almost on the grass, such he's trying to hug the last bit of shelter there, isn't he? Yeah, he's just trying to get in as, as, as deep in, uh, in uh, behind that, bump, that wheel as he possibly can. But I think Jonas Rickert is doing this turn on the front there. And... Um, not really having had a look to see where his teammates were before he did that and, and put mm. his teammates under a certain, certain amount of pressure. But now we're turning into a little bit more of a cross yeah. tailwind, so it'll be somewhat easier to uh, to continue this. But yeah, I think a slightly, uh, slightly missed opportunity if you were going to do any damage. Yes, they got rid of one or two riders, but not the riders that you wanted to uh, to get rid of. Well, Matthew van der Poel there, having the confidence to point right, uh, saying literally, I am going right. I'm going to swing out hard right and start to form this echelon. Poor old Hugo Hester Hofsetter. Look at him in the background there. Just caught out by that one. I don't know if he's going to get back on, Magnus, but he actually looked up just before they went into the turn to see if he had anyone on his wheel. <laughs> Bad yeah. news. No. To get dropped from a group at this stage, last race of the season, um, in that kind of wind, under just just that drilling, that little bit, a little bit of a drilling, a bit of a lifting, would be really unfortunate for him, wouldn't it? Yeah, it definitely would be. But I, I think it will be virtually impossible to get back in again here now, because you can see the pace is up now. Everyone is scared of missing a turn because they think, okay, if I miss a turn here now, then I'm going to end up in the same position again, and I'm not going to get, um, you know, make it to the uh, to the finish. So uh, with that. I think uh, these guys here now, uh, we're unlikely to see this split up the way I thought it was going to. No, they're utterly committed now. Matthew van der Poel was on the radio a couple of times after they'd turned onto these more twisting roads now as well. Tim de Klerk getting up on the front here now, nicknamed the tractor. He does so much work, such heavy workload for his De Kerning Quickstep team. He's the ever loyal teammate. Um, he can do just about anything, whether it's in the classics or anywhere else. He's always there and uh, does such a great job. Yeah, unmistakable figure. Um, some of the wider shoulders in cycling definitely easily recognizable not the most aero position and uh, not the most aero of shoulders to be hitting the wind with but boy is he powerful i, th I think his nickname of the tractor is slightly unfair <laughs> i've never seen a tractor go that fast because although he's a, no, he's a, he's a, a like think, diesel plugger isn't he he's quick yeah he's <laughs> i mean he's he's um a, like you said he's a great all-rounder but it, it ju it's just the engine that he has and, yeah. and the work that he does and um, you know unfaulting the way he he performs every single time he gets onto the bike and um, yeah I, like you said we, we should probably come up with a better nickname for him but um, we'll stick with this for now well, yeah, he's certainly the kind of teammate you would want. And he's certainly the kind of teammate you would want in a race like this at this stage in a race with 24k to go. Looks like we've had a bit of rain here as well now, so uh, surface is getting somewhat slippery. Yeah, they're starting to head further north now, back into Bulls Camp, and not the kind of uh, not the kind of roads you would want a slick surface on either. But at least the riders, as they always do with a big circular, have been through it before, so they know what to expect as they come through this now quite traditional finishing circuit. Matteo Trentin comes through doing another turn. Now, Trentin is going to be one of the men to watch who might try and feed off any team clashes or team rivalry between Alpes and Fenix and De Koenig Quickstep. It might be a good opportunity for the likes of him and Degenkolb to be lone operators in this lead group, Magnus. What do you think? Well, it, it definitely can be. Uh, and both riders very capable, uh, sprinters very capable of looking after themselves coming into finish. It's not the first time that they've been in this situation in, in these kind of uh, 
uh, type of races either. So, um, but as as I said, you know, if the group was slightly smaller, it'd be easier to uh, to freelance your way around and and uh, set up a sprint finish. Um, it's it's somewhat too big with a little bit too much power. But I think at the end of the day, what we're going to see today is just who's got the legs when we're coming into the final straight uh, to to do the sprint. It's not a traditional bunch sprint. It's it's a it's a sprint out of a reduced group who's had to work hard for the better part of 200 kilometers and um, with that it's um, yeah it's, it's it's just purely have you got that half a percent more in your legs left than the other rider around you so we are in the twisting winding in fact the most twisty windy bit of our finishing circuit in Verne and the riders head a little bit further inland and go around the uh, the town center and then head back out onto the uh, the outskirt roads. And then we've got that very, very long straight with the the wind behind them in actual fact as the riders head back towards Ustinkirka and uh, Coxeda itself and the seaside. We'll get to see the sand dunes and the coast one last time as the riders rip through there before uh, a very tight left-hander to take them to the finish line in Dupanet. Nice long uh, sprint straight. And there again, we get a look of some, some of the some of the road conditions here. I mean, uh, Magnus, you and I both live in Great Britain, and uh, we often hear people moaning about the roads. But often, where you see the division in uh, in mainland Europe, Belgium and Holland, it's the division between the cycle path and the road can actually be one of the most dangerous places, can't it? And more often than not, it is. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but um, I don't know why it is though. Because um, when when you're riding in uh, in, in Belgium, uh, especially, um, you know, it's it's just part of what it is and, and everyone deals with everyone no one really complains about the road conditions in, in Belgium they, they they just are what they are and uh, you, you ride them and yeah you either love them or you hate them and um, most riders that tend to race up here absolutely love being here so um, it, you know it's it's part it's kind of a mecca of cycling really Oh yeah, it absolutely is of course many of these riders will know these roads inside out not just at least from this race but uh, well, you know, Belgium is not an absolutely enormous country and there is so much racing, as you well know, Magnus, because you'll have done most of them, if not all of them. Um, <laughs> not just the pro races, but the, the kermesses, the weekday races, the evening races. There is so much racing in Belgium and it's, um, now it's kind of no surprise if we think back to not too long ago, the, the Bink Bank Tour, how quickly in Belgium they were able to throw together stages and races. The infrastructure, the <coughs> local readiness, the willingness of people to make racing happen is very much part of their kind of uh, social culture as well as their sporting culture, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's, uh, like I said, it, it is the number one sport uh, after football in, in, um, in Belgium. And sometimes I do think it actually overtakes football. But uh, yeah, it, I think it's, it's great for in the way that they uh, the local communities and people in in the country are willing to just you know let a bike race take take place and if it's uh, inconveniencing them somewhat on the day then so be it it's it's not you know we we had a bike race going past our door I couldn't get to work so you know it is what it is like and and the, everyone is okay with that for in one way or another um, but you know just looking at the the viewing figures and so on 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 some of the races over here um, take one of the cyclocross seasons for races for instance on uh, on the 30th of December in Degem, where the three quarters of the population in Belgium were watching that on TV. It's amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. And uh, yeah, I guess in a way that's why it's, it's part of the reason why it's still going on as well. Though, as we both said, it is a Wednesday in October. The weather is mildly inclement in Belgium, but um, it is good. I, I never ever thought I'd say this, but it is good to see very, very few people at the roadside. And thankfully, and many of you joining us watching this on television, that's the way to catch it during these COVID times and enjoy your cycle sport. And, you know, you, know, you never thought you would hear race promoters and organizers saying, please <laughs> no. stay away. <laughs> it's just totally against everything they and I think we believe in. But there we go. Um, you know, speaking from a, from a position as, a, as a, a Brit, actually, a British commentator, there's been so little racing. Really, the return to racing in the United Kingdom has been nothing like it has been in, in mainland Europe. And that's been sad to see. Um, there's been no tour of Britain, no women's tour this year, no tour series, those big British races that we're used to seeing. But I'm sure they'll be coming back in due course. Different countries, I suppose, due to their infrastructure and, um, and whatnot, 
Uh, coping with it in very different ways. Certainly the British perspective, I mean, I know we have lots of British viewers watching and listening, um, been far more muted and restrained in terms of road racing. Lots of time trialling going on, though, but uh, not so much on the road race and circuit racing front at all. It's a bit more socially distanced time trial, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, there is that. There's been some, uh, there's been some, uh, uh, quite a few, uh, certainly British elite riders turning their hand to time trialling this season. It's an opportunity to get their racing fix. Um, but we, we remain to see the effect of, um, of COVID. I think back actually totally, totally different thing. But if I think back to the, the late 90s, the early noughties and the arrival of uh, bovine flu, mad cow disease in the United Kingdom had a massive impact on mountain biking in Britain and, and the sport of mountain biking and really changed a lot of uh, the promotion of races. Many organizers, races and riders making a switch to the road. And uh, I know it sounds like a tiny thing. It's not a pandemic by any means. But these these these, uh, these occurrences can 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 massively change the face of a sport in a different country, as we've seen. Yeah, it definitely can do, but uh, hopefully we won't have uh, too much of a, a long-term effect on on the sport. Um, but yeah, it remains to be seen as the weather is now definitely turning a bit worse. Yep, I was going to say a few minutes ago, the sky behind them where we're seeing the head-on shots looked a little bit black, but I didn't want to tempt things. It looks like I needn't have to. Um, yeah, this is really going to spice things up with 17k to go, particularly as we get into slightly tighter corners yeah. coming back into Japan. Uh, we are about to turn up here now as well, so uh, you can see Matthew van der Poel making an acceleration there, and the, the pace is now on at the front. Yeah, very much so. That wind blowing hard from the right at this stage by the looks of it. Oh, sorry, from their left as they head their way back towards Ustinkirke and they're getting closer and closer. Ooh, One of the riders in the I ditch. Think that's Van it that does Van look like, it looks like the colour of the Dutch national champ. It is, he's gone down yeah. very fast into the ditch. Now, this is one of those dikes alongside the road here in the polders. It's the Appleton Fenix car. I think that is Van der Poel in the ditch. It, yeah, it is. Oh, Magnus, he's, I hope we are, of course, we are hoping he's all right. He's not moving very much at the moment. That's a long way down into that dike. That is Matthew Van der Poel in the ditch, straight out of the leading group. It looks like it's caused some problems in our leading group. We didn't see that happen. Winner just three days ago of the Tour of Flanders and now lying in a Belgian uh, ditch here alongside the coast. We do hope Matthew Van der Poel is okay. Gosh, that's a hard fall. Yeah, we did not want to see that. No, we don't want to see that. He is moving, which is good, but looking to get some medical assistance here. Ah, oh, gosh, what a come down in the space of just a few days and looking so good in that leading group as well. And as we return our focus to the racing, it's done some damage there. Christophe Laporte, Jempi Drucker, Stefan Kung, uh, three of the four riders detached and working their way back on. Jempi Drucker looking to close up towards the back of our leading group. Well, these riders will have been watching Matthew van der Poel and expecting moves from him. I think they're looking to try and keep him warm. I think, Magnus, thankfully, he looks lucid. Here we go, we get a little look at it. Uh, van der Poel using the shelter on the left-hand side of these riders. Again, he's trying to find that little pocket as we have a wipe of the lens at just the wrong moment, straight down. Oh. I think he's hit the grass. We saw him hugging the grass earlier, didn't we? Gosh, I don't know whether he hit the tree at that point. Oh, gosh, that's the last of that uh, oh, shot we want to see to a certain extent, isn't it? Oh, he's, he's stood up at least. Oh. Well, oh. understandably unsteady on his feet. What a come down from the man who won Tour of Flanders on Sunday and now finds himself in a West Flandrian ditch. Ah, oh, not the exit we were expecting for, but I have to say, not his fault by any means, Magnus, and I'm sure you'll back me up on this having seen it, but he doesn't half find the pockets of wind protection that the other riders perhaps don't. We've seen him earlier just tucking himself in a, in a gap that possibly some of the other riders wouldn't take, literally kissing the grass. And, and it looked to me like he just kissed it a bit too much and slid potentially. Of course, I don't know. We don't know. No. But, but uh, he was mighty close, wasn't he? Yeah, he, he was. And um, But, the, you know, that's what what you you kind of need to yep. uh, to be doing at these points to uh, to get yourself into uh, into the mix of the racing and um, these are the risks that that you as a cyclist live with and yeah I'm just 
thankful to see him on his feet and he's up uh, up and about and it doesn't look like there's anything too uh, too bad with him in terms of injuries so um, we're grateful for that yeah absolutely so we look to see the makeup of this what is now leading group Stefan Kung has gone and look at the conditions they turned proper nasty haven't they it really yeah. has turned bad out there for the closing stages of the men's one day world tour races absolutely classic conditions here at the front end look at the faces John Dagenkolb coming through Matteo Trentin on his wheel there as well he's got Eve Lampart the big strong men swinging in the favors of the wind loving strong men here at this stage now that is Tim Merlier on the back of that group so although we've had uh, really unfortunate crashes all the way through this race the cream of the wind loving hard men have risen to the very top in what is now abysmal conditions out there look at this well, look at the strength of the wind there now though but it's there's actually there's four De Kerning quick step riders in the, in that front group there now and uh, yeah um, Tim Merlier has made it in the Matteo Trentin John Degenkolb um, just trying to see this anyone yep. else uh, Eve Lampert yeah is in there one two three four five six riders Casper Asgreen as you say um, did you I think Tim Tim de Klerk is still in there if I'm not mistaken he might be oh, yeah he's on the back been, there yep there we go well I don't know if they're waiting is that a bit of an easing there I'm not sure. No, I think it might just be the <laughs> might just be the wind hitting them, getting confirmation on our screen. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting one here now. What what do you do as uh, if you're uh, Trentin Degen Kolb or uh, Tim Merlier because you've got four De Kerning quick step riders oh. that you're working against. Yeah. 12 kilometers to go. Um, you can see Tim Merlier is uh, is waving his hands around a bit there now. Just. Uh, um, yeah, he wants to went, wait for Jonas Rickert, who isn't actually too far, or wasn't too far as they were behind as they went into that roundabout. But, um, oh. yeah, there we are. Um, so, Matthew van der Poel's road season comes to an end three days after his brilliant win in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. He's climbing into a team car. Well, if Tim Merlier goes on to win today, Matthew van der Poel can be rightly happy with the amount of work he did because it wasn't like he was holding back waiting for this finish, was it, Magnus? He was no. contributing strongly. Yeah, he, he definitely was. Um, you know, it, but he will be angry and upset with that. Um, it's, it's never how you want to finish this season or any bike race, really. But at the end of the day, it's, it's part of the sport, unfortunately. Sooner or later, you are coming down. And um, I'm just happy to see that he, um, he's OK. The look at the strength of the wind here now. Yeah, it is absolutely ripping from the left. The De Koning quick set riders offering a little bit of protection at this stage to the others. Kasper Askreen, the Danish national champion, rolling through. Real firepower in there from that team. And they're committed now. The question, though, of course, is who are they committed to in that group? Who, who, who are they uh, getting in their ears as being the protected rider? Mm, very good question. Mm. <laughs> very yeah. good question. Well, we know Eve Lampard is in good sprinting form. He's just come fifth on Sunday in Flanders. Yeah. But uh, Askreen isn't the kind of rider that would look to leave it that late, though, Magnus Woody. He's possibly the rider that might look to clip off late on in this one as they come back in to Depanna. It is 10k to go. Now, whenever I'm on the mic with any co-commentator, Magnus, I try and get him to give me a prediction. Can I tease it out of you? Who's going to win this? Tim Merlier. Tim Merlier. <laughs> right, OK. I'm... Oh, do you know what? I'm going to go with Matteo Trentin uh, in a sprint. So let's see. Let's see who's right. <laughs> I'm glad yeah, I could no, tempt that, you. This this will be the news on uh, on in Belgian media tomorrow if uh, <laughs> if the Kerning quick step yeah. miss out from yeah. from this group here now with four out of uh, out of seven riders. It's uh, well, yeah. That, yeah, but I wonder if they. Well, we're asking the question: Who are they going to protect? Who are they going to look to work for? Um, wouldn't it be wonderful, actually, having mentioned the tractor? Wouldn't it be wonderful if if uh, Tim de Klerk clipped off and took the win? It would it be would great. Be, wouldn't it, it would be well deserved, definitely. Uh, and I think they're going to have to uh, probably try and uh, and do a few attacks here now to to see if they can get rid of this. But the problem is yeah. with the window, um, it's so difficult to to open up the gap and uh, get get clear. 
Yeah, absolutely. And with those kind of... Well, actually, Jonas Rickard is coming back in by the looks of it. Now, Malia won't be looking back at this stage. He might be being told that in his ear because Malia is uh, looking to roll through with these guys. But there is Jonas Rickard making his way back in. So there's a big he's strong rider. At, he's, he's just shouting at uh, Tim Malia. <laughs> try and get them to stop. Try and get them to stop. So just, he wants he wants Tim Malia to get up there and basically uh, dis disrupt the, uh, the riding. And uh, Tim Malia is moving up and... Uh, manages mm. to somehow slow down this a little bit now make the effort there jonas yeah they're looking at the uh, right hander here and we are in ustinkirka nearly back to the seaside and the dunes of coxeda and the coining quick set the coining quick set riders having a look across the field there to see where the next riders are closing in i think this is it now i can't see it coming together too much more it's just a shame that we've had splintering caused by crashes and that bad weather. It does look, Magnus, like although the wind is still absolutely ripping, it looks like we're out of the rain here as we come back onto the sand dunes of Coxeda. Yeah, for, for the time being at least it looks like it's, uh, it stops raining, but the wind hasn't uh, dropped in any way, shape or form. And Oh, there's a bit of a move coming here around the corners. It is Yves Lampard. Yes. Lampard is feeling frisky. Um, we did we did say that really in those in those uh, four Deconic quick step riders, there isn't really a recognised sprinter. So we'll be expecting this all the way through the next eight kilometres. That's for sure. Eve Lampard, the first to try his hand, making Matteo Trentin chase. Tim Merlier locked onto Trentin's wheel. That's a good wheel to be on yeah. because uh, Trentin is another one of those super consistent, attentive riders, isn't he, Magnus? Well, the three fastest sprinters out of uh, out of out of this lot here is, would be uh, the Tim Merlier. Uh, Matteo Trentin and, and John Degenkolb. Um, you know, that, that, yeah. on paper, they are by far the quickest riders in, in this group. So it's going to, uh, to have to be up to um, the Kearney quick step to, to really try and split this group up again. Here goes Tim. Um, Tim de Klerk. Tim de Klerk having a go on, going to have a go, <laughs> being shut down there by Tim Merlier. We, we, yeah, we didn't, I wasn't sure whether we would see de Klerk have a go, but uh, yeah, I genuinely mean what I said. It would be brilliant, I think, for the world cycling community to see the likes of a Tim de Klerk clip off and uh, get his broad shoulders in the air. I think only Ed Clancy can actually um, can rival him for shoulder width <laughs> in terms of, of, uh, of terms of, yeah, shoulder width. But um, he uses them to good effect, a good wheel to be on, not least because of his wife shoulders but because he's an absolute beast and here he goes and exiting Ustinkirka back onto the coastline but you can see the Klerk difference there as well between the Tim Merlier whose uh, mm. acceleration is so quick that he manages to uh, to actually get on to uh, uh, to Tim de Klerk before he's even got it uh, halfway up to full speed Trentin having a good long. I thought he was going to attack there, but I think these guys have hit the winds here. Yes, they have, because they've headed left, if you like. They've headed westward as they follow the railway line. That means they're heading straight back into a headwind. You can see that from the way they're tucking down. Eve Lampart doing a long... In fact, Eve Lampart looking back. Trentin's let the wheel go, and Lampart has gone. He's hugging the edge of that railway line right now, and it's going to take a concerted effort, because the Deconic quick set won't do anything. It's going to take one of the others. Trentin's just been doing a lot of work. Time for Dagen Cole, perhaps or Jonas Rickard to close this one down. Trentin's hanging, and all the while, Yves Lampard is going. Yeah, well, this, this is a, a difficult moment because um, none of the other guys really want to take this um, and, and work to bring him back. This, so, could, um, this could be it, couldn't it, Magnus? Yeah. This could be it. Here goes, they, they're going to go. They're going to need to go now. Jonas Rickard. Oh, I don't know how much he's got left in his legs. It was an, I was amazed that he got back on by himself. He's gone. He's got Tim de Klerk for company. De Klerk's not going to come through and do anything. That's absolutely for sure. This is very much in the favour of Yves Lampert. The Belgian rider, he's being given around about five seconds at the moment. You can see it visually. Jonas Rickard may as well just get on with this because he knows he's got Tim Miller there. If he can, if he's got anything left, Rickard is one of the few riders that should be toasted on the front of this one. But even he's looking back. Yeah, and here goes uh, Matteo Trentini is having a clip off the front there now just to see whether he can open up a gap. I think it, it's going to require collaboration between um, between uh, Alpecin Phoenix and uh, the uh, Matteo Trentini and uh, John Dengenkolb to uh, to bring this back. Yeah. But well, 
uh, it's not got long, six kilometres. We are uh, right back on the coast here, although we're surrounded by houses. We'll be 13, seeing more of the sand dunes now. Yeah, look at that. The 29-year-old uh, Belgian, Yves Lampard, has taken a flyer up just the right time there alongside the long straight road by the railway line. Jonas Ricker again using the other side of the road to try and get a bit of gap, but as always, he has uh, a De Koenig quick step rider close it down. Dagen Kolb, I, I, I've looked at his face the last hour or so, and I'm wondering whether he's bluffing. I don't think he is. I think no. he is going through uh, the mincer in the last hour of this race. And all the while, of course, the De Koenig quickstep riders sit, ready to chase down or jump on the next move. I'm not sure Jonas Rickard can do much more. And Tim Merlier himself now is having to come through and uh, oh, aid the this chase. This will be interesting then, adding another two riders into this with Stefan Kung and, uh, and yes. uh, Jempi Drucker. Yes, now there's two strong riders. In fact, Stefan Kung's. if you could call up anyone from the group behind to try and help chase, it would be Stefan Kung, wouldn't it? But uh, he's got to get on first, Magnus, and yeah. it's not got long. Having got on, if they're going to add anything to this chase, they'd need to go straight through, wouldn't they? And that's a big, big ask. Yeah, that is a massive ask. Um, and it just looked like... Uh Jonas Ricca was starting to uh, to wind this one up and, and decide to sacrifice himself with whatever he's got left in his legs. Yves Lampert, the Belgian here, has had a, a brilliant restart to the season post -lock. Those are the ones that tend to stick. Lampard asking our camera there, what's the gap? Well, I'm sure that's what he's asking. He's being shouted it. 20, <laughs> 20. 20, there we go. 20 seconds. Well, good to know our ticker's accurate. If that's what the bikes are saying, that's what it is, 20 seconds. In fact, our ticker is saying it's going out 22, 23. As riders behind, Arch Help coming from anywhere else. We haven't yet seen Jem Drucker come to the front, well, and uh, he might not. Kasper Aspring hasn't been out of second wheel ever since uh, Yves Lampard went up the road, and that's, that's the one thing that's stalling the chase here now is, uh, is the fact that he's sat there and uh, just following the wheel around all the time. And like you said, Dagan, Called, I don't know if he has the legs and if, or if he doesn't want to commit to it. Um, difficult position to be, but wonder if uh, King is going to have a have a dig yet down the outside of this one soon, because he's the kind of rider who, after a short recovery like uh, like he's now had, um, he would probably look at trying to make an attack. <laughs> Oh, shite. 
Bolschreit. Krieger. Bolschreit, Krieger. Verkehrsdorf. Yeah, certainly his style. Eve Lampert, this is his style. He is a uh, ragged but effective man. He's chewing the bars, isn't he? We all out. This is absolutely all out. There's the. It's a deal or die move, it, isn't it? Is. <laughs> As you'd expect, they only have just over 3K to go. And for all these riders, 3K to go to the end of their 2020 season. And Eve Lampard making to, looking to end what's been a really, really good second half of this season for him. The team car actually, by the looks of it, on the other side of the that's railway the, line. I think that's a VIP car for the county ah. quick steppers alongside the road. <laughs> so it's just getting a few time gaps there being shouted out from them. Well, the man from Isachem in Belgium looking to make this one stick with under 3K to go now. And of course, uh, maybe for those of you who are new to watching bike racing, as there's so much of it on right now, um, you might be wondering how on earth one rider can ride away from the others. It's not just about being stronger. It's about that consistent effort, Magnus, of not having the looking round, the waiting, the flicking of elbows that you're seeing going. But there's only the pommel, there's the pommel. The Van Asbroek en Pustelberger. Olsen en Doyle. Dat was het hier. Uh, and you know he got the gap by uh, other riders looking at each other. Everyone is equally as, as fatigued and tired. And when you're getting into this position, when you're sitting out front and you got a bit of a gap, then um, you know you, 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 as Tim de Klerk is having a good. They no. clearly want a one-two here if they wow. can. Wow. I was not expecting that. If you'd have asked me who would attack, I would not expect it to be Tim de Klerk because if he does anything, well, look, as they close it down, that could have eaten in another three, three or so seconds maybe to that lead. The gap is good. 30 yeah. seconds now to Yves Lampert, but that's an unusual one, isn't it? Well, they're not, they're not going to catch uh, Yves Lampert in, in on, by 30 seconds in two mm. kilometres, mm. uh, regardless of how they do it. Even with the best lead-out train in the world, that would be a tall order. Um, so um, having a few digs off the front here now could it potentially secure another and a, a, a one two for them there goes Kung we th knew he would we thought he would he's not going to chase back on and do nothing Stefan Kung the Swiss rider in the colors of Group Armour FDJ uh, gives it a good hard dig but he's been closed down and Kasper Askren knows who to watch he's just pushing Tim Merlier out a little bit Jonas Rickart goes through having seen Merlier being squeezed out of it under 1500 meters to go now for Yves Lampert the former Belgian champion he's going to win this race today he's going to win the final um, men's world tour race single one day race I should say of the year I was going to say just, just watch out as well though for Bert van Leerbergi. I know he's had a hard ride to get here but he's now sat on the back of, uh, of that group for, for a period of time and he's actually relatively quick in a sprint so um, you know I think the Koenig quick step are attacking with uh, with uh, Tim de Klerk and uh, Kasper Askren and um, if it comes down to a sprint the more Degen Kolb, Trentin and uh, uh, Tim Merlier has to chase the, 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 the more it plays into the favour of uh, Van Leerberg. Well we have now swung onto the uh, the finishing 
straight by the looks of it. This shot looking down from the finish line. You can hear the announcer on the finish line. There's a reasonable crowd that have gathered for the end of this one. Thankfully, well spaced out, by the way. That one, that shot foreshortening or making the gap, the, the group look a lot to, closer than they are. Eve Lampart now knows what he has coming. He is going to win the final one-day men's world tour race of the year. The question is, of course, what's going to happen in the sprint behind? Casper uh, Askreen now having closed everything down is on the front of that one. Are De Quick Quickstep going to get the one, two, three? We don't know, but I can tell you the winner is already celebrating. Eve Lampert, the 29 year old from Isachim, is going to win this year's Dreidags at Brugge de Pada. And there he is taking the applause of a modest but very excited crowd in Belgium because a Belgian has won the final one day World Tour race of the year. Eve Lampert takes the win and the sprint behind has started, but one right has Tim driven clear by the looks of it. Tim de Klerk has, uh, <laughs> has go. gone off the front here now. Can he stay away to the line? Oh, what a day by the decoding quick step riders. Tim de Klerk trying to hang on. Tim Merlier also closing down. John Dagenkolb trying to get on the podium himself. Those two sprinting this one out. Dagenkolb so close with Merlier. Tim de Klerk takes second, and it looks like Tim Merlier taking the final spot on the podium there. Jonas Rickard rolling in just off the back. Podium. Yes. Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh. 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 Say it, say it. Uh, you walk so much. Oh, I'm all of it. Oh, Tom. It's not on the just moment that thing is here. Oh, what's it? Yeah, man. Fuck, man. In a twist, yeah. What are you doing? Say what? 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 Ja, Oh, top, we mogen verdienen. Ja, cool. Ja, Helemaal was er met Mathieu, je zat in mijn wiels hier. En... Dat was aan het opschrijven aan de linkerkant. Ah ja, dat zou een moment uh, verdienen. En ik had een kwartje nee, gehad van nee, hier. Nee, ja. Hij weer een plat erin, Dovin. Kom er weer in, ik zal oh. hier in de koers voor bief letten. Ik zei ja, dat hij weer een raar. Ja, ik heb het dan hier. Hier in mijn dingen zien. En hij heeft er nog een reserve hey. voor het podium. De volgende nom op en de volgende hier. Ja, ja, godverdomme, een ja, ja, paasje, ja, hè. Ja. 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 Hij is een sprint aan het Hij wel goed Een rechte deur en rechts doen. En rechts in de pad. Oké. Dat is wat je wilde veranderen. Ik ben Yves Lampaard, van harte gefeliciteerd. Hoeveel deugd doet dit na zo'n sukkelseizoen, laat ons zeggen? Ja, inderdaad. Het was zo'n opluchting als je dan toch nog een koers kunt meenemen. Van het seizoen en uh, dan aan de wereldtourkoers. Uh, een hele mooie ook, denk ik. Het was denk ik super om te zien. Uh, een wilde Wire Festival. Ja, inderdaad. Het was echt mentaal een zware koers ook. Want je moest iedere seconde opletten. Het kost zo in de, weer op de kant vliegen. En, en ja, je weet nooit wat er gebeurt. En het was echt uh, ja, een zware koers. Maar ik denk dat we weer met de ploeg fantastisch niet voor hebben gedaan. Uh, met vier man mee op uh, wat was dat pacht. Um, ja, denk, uh, ja, op zeven zelfs, daar helemaal op het op einde. Zeven, ja. Inderdaad, dus, uh, ja, dan hadden we de koers volledig onder controle. En uh, het is echt een plezier om zo te koersen natuurlijk. Ja, ik zag je heel veel praten in die finale. Had je gezegd tegen jouw ploegmaat, mannen, ik heb superbenen. Ik ga het een paar keer proberen. Um, ik had niet met zoveel woorden gezegd, maar, maar Bert uh, van Aardbergen vroeg aan mij, uh, moet ik de sprint aantrekken voor u? En uh, ik heb gezegd, nee Bert, doe je één sprint, ik ga nog iets proberen. En uh, ja, dan... Uh, ik was wat poker uh, op het laatste. Ik had een keer geprobeerd daar in ons steunkerk, uh, dat binnenbandje. Maar daar lieten ze mij niet gaan. En dan op de grote weg, van op de kop eigenlijk gaan. Achter een minuutje had ik eigenlijk wel wat spijt. <laughs> <laughs> Mijn benen ontploft. Want oei, het, is nog, het was ja. nog wel een kilometer of zes. En, en, die, en die wind was echt verschrikkelijk de, vandaag. Dus, uh, maar uiteindelijk uh, zag ik, het had het maar ik had niets van communicatie, dus het was wat, wat, moe, wat moeilijk. Maar gelukkig uh, ze, riep de cameraman een keer uh, 18 seconden en dan wist ik, nu gaan ze dat wel echt moeten koesten van achter om mee terug te krijgen. En uh, ik ben blij met stampen en alles geven tot aan de finish. En, uh, ja, uh, 
had, ik had uh, genoeg voorsprong om te winnen. Ja, het was echt al een feestje daar met jouw drie ploegmaats. Ja. En jullie moeten een padje bellen, hè? dat mag je niet vergeten. Ja, inderdaad. Het, vooral Timmy. Vooral Timmy, want Timmy weer een super wedstrijd gereden. En uiteindelijk nog tweede voor, voor, uh, voor iemand die zoveel werk verricht onderweg is. Dat wel uh, fantastisch. Het was ook qua veden zijn omloop. Dus mensen onderschatten Tim soms een beetje te veel. Hè? Maar als je ziet dat hij zijn eigen koers kan rijden, kan hij ook naar een uitslag rijden. Ja. One, dus, uh, one question in English. What a great effort, what a great team effort. How hard was this race in, in the wind? Yeah, it was, uh, with the echelons? Yeah. yeah, with the echelons it was incredibly hard. You had to stay focused all the time. Uh, every second something could happen. Uh, look to Mathieu, he touched the back wheel of somebody else, I guess, because I didn't saw it. And he crashed in the ditch, so uh, I hope he, he is really fine. Uh, but it was uh, really a hard race, but a race that I really like. Yeah. The season is over. How will you celebrate this? Uh, I will uh, <laughs> celebrate it with a, a big... <laughs> Uh, pak friet, French, French fries. fries. Yeah, uh, pak uh, friet. Pak, pak friet with uh, <laughs> Biki butter and I don't know <laughs> what I will take, but uh, I will uh, I will enjoy it. Uh, okay. Enjoy your pak friet. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Ivan Bart. <laughs>